As of tonight, we are trying to figure out how to live stream. So I'm assuming that we have some people tuning in on Facebook. And so welcome, welcome to Hope tonight. This is our service, we call it The Connection. And it'll also be recorded so that we can put it on, uh, uh, oh, uh, delayed play a little bit later. But we're here tonight, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, we've had a great holiday, nothing around here froze or broke. And uh, so we're, we're good with that. We, uh, some of us met here this morning and trimmed bushes. And uh, so we had to work out and so I'm really tired. Uh, but uh, we'll get through. So uh, I'm just going to turn it right over and let uh, Ginger play the video and we'll get started.
online too. We're, we're going to have a, an all-church meeting on Saturday, January the 14th at 10.30. Uh, we'll have a light lunch after that, but we'd like for everybody, to, everybody, Saturday people, Sunday people, once in a while people, uh, <laughs> whatever, we would like for everybody to be there. We've got some stuff we need to talk about at the church, and we need to get everybody's input on it. Uh, so uh, this is New Year's Eve, and uh, we're here, and uh, there's a lot of people, I guess, going to go elsewhere. Uh, I probably will make it, I, I, I'm really trying to decide whether I'm going all the way into the living room for New Year's Eve or whether I'll just stay in my bedroom. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be much party around our place. That's right. <laughs> but, uh, but that's okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world uh, today. You know, Pope Benedict died. Um, that's a really sad thing. Um, Barbara. Barbara Walters died. Um, yeah. Yeah. Pele died this week. Pele, yeah. You know, a lot of people probably don't know who Pele is, but if you're growing wait up. Minute, wait a minute, I just heard, <laughs> this is going to be weird. I, I was hearing an interview on NPR News that Barbara Walters was, he was, she was talking, and I didn't hear the end of it when I came into the church. I didn't know she died. I just thought yeah. that was an interview with Barbara Walters. No, no, she died. So, I'm sorry I even mentioned that. It's okay. It just shows that you don't pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know either. Get in the middle of the news. <laughs> well, well yeah, I mean, yeah. but but you know, it, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, in, in the world, and uh, I think uh, hopefully everybody had a good Christmas and it was safe. And I hope nobody's pipes froze in all the water we had, or ice we had the other day. We did well here, no, no issues. And uh, but you know, as, as you look around, we we were we cleaned the bushes out in front of the church today and. Uh, we found a bed, a little, a little apartment over there in the bushes in front of the, the fellowship hall. Uh, there, somebody had a little cook stove and they uh, had a bedroll and they had uh, some jackets and stuff. There's another homeless guy around here and he took the jacket to go wash it. I guess he thought it was better than what he had. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that going on. And, and, and sometimes we live in this bubble where we don't realize it. We don't see it. Um, and I, if you're like me, maybe we don't want to see it. Because it's ugly. It's just ugly. People are hurting and people are hungry. And uh, so uh, we're always grateful for donations to the Blessing Box. And uh, people are grateful for having that there. Let's pray. Gracious God, you are so wonderful to us. And it's your desire that you'd be wonderful for everybody. 
There's so many people out there that don't understand your mercy and your grace. How it can take them from nowhere to somewhere. How it can take them from hopelessness to hope. So God, we ask you to help us to be Jesus Christ for those people so we can show them we love them and we care about them. We have mercy on them. Help us to realize how blessed we are and how much you have blessed us to help others. We pray for those people that we know that are dealing with illness, sickness. As of tomorrow morning, we'll have a brand new bishop in the Texas Annual Conference. We pray for Bishop Harvey. Pray for all the preachers that are finding new churches to go to because of this craziness that we've had in the church. Pray for churches that are making decisions that may affect their long-time relationships with people. There's so much to pray for, and yet we have so much to be thankful for. So let us start our prayer today with thanks. Let us have a prayer of concern for others, and let us end it with thanks. Thanks for the loving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. enter a time of worship, I, I'd invite you to stand if you want and uh, sing out as loud as you can. Here we go. Forever rain. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me. You are love. You are love. On this day for all to see. You are light. You are light. When the darkness closes in. You are hope. You are hope. You have come.
in the lectionary where there's all kinds of choices. There's a baptism of the Lord, which is one of our choices when Jesus gets baptized. Um, there's also some other ones. And then this one is actually the one, I guess, for New Year's Day. Um, but it's from Matthew 25. It starts with verse 31 and goes to the ways. Out of all the Bible scriptures anywhere, if you want to know which one I think is maybe the most important, this is it. I think these words are what are meant for us to hear. I think these are how we're supposed to live. But it's presented in a little bit of a screwy way, so pay attention to it. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All of the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at his right, and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom is prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. 
Then the righteous people will answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it for the least of these who were members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. A naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So I was in Mexico, in Mexico City, at a seminary called Valles Camargo. It was 50 degrees inside. I was cold. The walls were, the floors were terrazzo, like concrete. The walls were cinder blocks. There was no heat. And the instructor, the professor, read this scripture. Now, I got to tell you, I heard it different when I was uncomfortable. I mean, we're sitting here in a nice, comfortable place. You hear it different. Now, if, if I'd have turned off the furnace and it was 50 in here and you were cold, maybe you'd hear it different too. But here's what you need to know about this scripture. This scripture wasn't, really, wasn't given to the people that are sinners and the people that are faithful. It was given to the faithful. This message was given to the people that were followers of the way. In other words, this message is given to people of faith everywhere. And the problem is some people of faith are doing good and don't know it. And some people of faith aren't paying any attention at all. So we spend an inordinate amount of time in the church of asking people, are you baptized? Have you, have you had your communion? Have you done all that stuff? We spend a lot of time on that. A lot. What we ought to be spending time on is are you aware of when you're doing God's work? And who are you to say you can't do it? You see, so many people want to put in there, well, he's a really good person. Well, according to Jesus, four times in about ten verses, we find out what good people do. What do good people do? Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, heal the sick. That's what good people do. It never asked one question here, oh, did you go to the front of a church and get baptized? Are you a sinner? He didn't to qualify that. This is the people that profess Jesus Christ as Savior, and they're doing God's work, but they don't even know it. You ever, you ever been in a car? I did this the other day. I was headed to the bank. I know where the bank is. I know. I go down this road, and I turn right on that road, and I turn right on the other road, and I go two driveways and turn into the bank. And if I go too far, I'm back at the Beltway 8, and I miss the bank. I know where the bank is. And I found myself in the Target parking lot. <laughs> You see, nominal Christians get all caught up in the dogma or the teachings of our faith. Real Christians are out doing the work. And anytime you start thinking that you're not good enough, you need to go back and read this. Because the people that thought they were good enough didn't even know when they were doing good. And the people that thought they were, that the other people, they weren't even trying when did we not feed you and clothe you? It's always a problem. You know, you, you drive down the road and you get to this homeless guy who's standing out there begging on the side of the road. At least it's a problem for me. I don't know whether to give him anything or not. Yeah. Because I'm not very trusting. Now, I can tell you, if you want to go by that little mantra, what would Jesus do? Jesus would give him something. <laughs> Jesus wouldn't worry one minute what they were going to do with it. 
That wouldn't be it. And the reason that, that, that we're in such a dilemma with the people around us today, and this is in the church too, is that there's a lot of arguments about, well, those people believe this, and those people believe that, and, and they're accepting anybody into their church, and we want only people that smell and look like us. And then they want to lift up and put people like the preacher and some Christians on some kind of a pedestal. i got to tell you, friends, we are all sinners. That's right. There isn't a category of sin. One is as good as the other. And when we start judging, we have gone into the other place, and that's where the goats are. And we need to get over it. If we want to change the world, Jesus came and he made a big change. No question about it. But if we want to change the world, we've got to start acting like we mean it. And it's got to be intentional. We can't accidentally do good. I mean, we can. And this isn't meaning that we should pat ourselves on the back and hold up a flag and say, I did good today. That's not the point. We ought to wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to go out today and do all the good in the name of Jesus Christ that I can. And then we can, if we want to, we can say, I'm not deserving of that grace. I don't deserve it. I'm not good enough. But I'm going to do it anyway because God said to So what it means to me is there are a lot of times when I have to just bite the bullet and go do what I'm supposed to do and realize from the get-go that I'm not worth it. I don't deserve God's grace. That's right. Neither do you. We haven't earned it. In fact, the question is, if we really get picky about it, we deserve the other. But you know why we don't get it? Because Jesus Christ has love and mercy and grace, and He knows that there's something inside of us that's worth it. Do you know that? That there's something inside of you that's worth it. You help people. You're kind to people. I was watching uh, Texas Country Reporter today. The guy was 54 years old. He retired. He didn't know what he was going to do in his retirement. He watched an old show of the Texas Country Reporter where he saw something called Lone Star Santas. He happened to be kind of chubby. He happened to have white hair. He said, maybe I can do that. And so he became a Santa. He watched the TV show. He saw people doing good. He decided he wanted to be a part of that. And it changed his life. The sad part about this is the people out doing the good, they don't know they're doing it. They, your life can't be changed. Just like we would tell somebody coming to AA, you know, the first thing you need to do is don't drink. What's going to happen when you don't drink is a whole lot of stuff is going to happen in your life and some of it's going to be pretty sorry because you're not going to be able to self-medicate. You're going to have to face the reality. And, and, and then you're going to have to realize what we all need to realize, not just people going to, hey, that we, <laughs> that we got a problem and we can't fix it on our own. But so many people want to judge and say, well, well, that guy over there, boy, he's a righteous guy. He gives away a lot of stuff to the community. He does a lot of other stuff. Yeah, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about an intentional effort to be a follower of Jesus Christ. To, to go out and do the good that God has given us the ability to do. Now, that's different for all of us, right? Some of us can give a lot of money. Some of us can't give any money. Well, we can reach out. We can be kind. We can act like we've been saved. We can act like we've been given the greatest gift ever. It's not about whether you're saved or not. That's, this passage isn't about that. This is about the people that say they're saved not living up to what God has called us to do. We live in a time right now when churches are not full. The truth of the matter is you could probably close the nearest five churches and put all the people in any one of us. That's just the way it is. And it isn't about church. Church doesn't save you. Come to church and you'll say, yeah, you know, I can pray for you. I can make the sign of the cross, but my blessing's not going to save you. What's going to save you is this list of stuff. And, and, and I, whoever we are, we need to look at that list. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, take care of the sick. That's what Christians are called to do. 
We need to quit worrying about whether that guy over there is doing whatever he's doing. Or that woman over there, she's, you know, she does that. That's not relevant. All I want is let's line up together, sinners all, and make a difference in this world that we live in. And I'm just silly enough to believe that if we do that, we can change the world. I think sometimes it's contagious. I know in my life, I've had people look at me and say, why were you so nice to that guy? Now, understand, I don't mean take him home with you necessarily. <laughs> I'm not telling you that we have to, to, to embrace their behavior. But we surely don't have time to judge. And I think that's the place where I see Christians getting into the deepest trench. Is that we spend an awful lot of time saying other people aren't worthy. And the truth is, Jesus Christ came. We celebrated Christmas Day. Emmanuel, God is with us for everybody. For the people that are doing dastardly stuff down the street somewhere. For the people that are going to drink too much and drive tonight. For the people that are going to be really, really stupid and shoot guns in the air tonight. I mean, th th there's not a better word than stupid for that. But, but, but God loves them too. And maybe instead of judging them and pushing them off and pushing them away, we ought to start to embrace them as fellow human beings that have an opportunity to join us in changing the world. When we, uh, in, the, in the United Methodist Church, when we do baptisms, especially for babies and young children because they can't answer for themselves, so we answer for them. We have a phrase that, that it says, uh, do you embrace the power of Jesus Christ to renounce spiritual wickedness? We did a sermon seminar one time and we asked people what, what renouncing looks like. And you know about half the people in that room said you turn your back on it. It's not what renounce means to me. It means I need to face it head on and say that is not acceptable. And we Christians ought to be doing it to each other. That's what we take a vow to do. You know in Matthew in another place it tells us how to, how to, how to have difficulties. What's the first thing you do when you have a difficulty? Go talk to somebody. Now, most of us that ever went to AA, we never talked to anybody. We just carried around a burden and a bucket. When I was working in the rehab, we used to give the new recovering people, we'd give them a roll of toilet paper. They got to tear off one sheet every time they let go of some of that stuff. Some of them kept the roll for a long time. Other places I worked, we gave them a bag of rocks and they got to carry the rocks around because that's what we're doing, friends. We're carrying around so much garbage with us, we can't do the work God calls us to do. we got to let go of that stuff. Yeah, you are whoever you are. Whatever you've done, whatever you struggle with in your life, whether it was alcohol or pornography or whatever it is, it doesn't, that, that's not relevant to doing God's work because what happens to you, you start to do God's work and those things fade away. You start to put other people first, those things fade away. The desire to do them is, fit, is, is filled up with the desire to do the other stuff. We are people with a great big hole in this. It's a spiritual hole. It needs to be filled up with something. Some of us choose to do it with work. We become workaholics. Some of us choose to do it with alcohol. Some people do it with drugs. I want to tell you, if you just let God fill it up, you'll find your life changed. You know, when you sin, if you're close to God, you say, wow. And you have this thing called guilt or shame. Sometimes it changes you. If you just want to go out and ignore it, then you become one of these other people. But they don't do it. They don't care that they're not doing it. They're not paying any attention. This particular scripture, when I came home, I went and talked to this preacher friend of mine. And I said, uh, you ever read Matthew 25, verse 31 and follow? He said, yeah. I don't read it very often. It makes me feel guilty. Sometimes preachers get all caught up and stand up in front of a bunch of people and say important stuff. Not me. First of all, the only important stuff I have to say comes from the Bible. Not from me. Because what I think of, you don't want to hear. And secondly, I'm not better than anybody. I'm just as likely to be doing stupid stuff, making mistakes, sinning. You know, I got a few things straight, and I don't drink. I got that straight. 
30 some odd years now. I have a bunch of other stuff I'm working on. How about you? And I ain't over it. But that doesn't mean I need to quit being me suddenly and have this transformation to start doing the stuff God wants me to do. In my failures, look at the Bible. Look at who the people are that are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. We've got all kind of folk. That's kings, got a prostitute, a whole bunch of people. You see, the, the people that are doing God's work, they're not perfect. They never have been. That's one of the reasons the Jews have so much trouble seeing Jesus as the Messiah. They wanted a guy on a white horse with lots of armor to come and overtake Rome. They didn't want somebody who was going to come along and create a grassroots movement of doing good. They didn't like him because he broke the rules. I kind of like breaking rules. I kind of like doing stuff nobody expects. I love it when we have the pumpkins and 500 kids come down here and we see the kids play out in the field and we give them all pumpkins. I love that. Not sure what the pumpkin patch people are going to do to us, but we're going to figure something out. I love it when, when somebody writes a note like they did the other day and puts it out in the blessing box and says, you know, you guys have a food pantry that isn't judgmental, it doesn't have a time limit, it doesn't require us to fill out a bunch of questions, it just is there. Isn't that the way God is? God's just there. Yeah. In the good times, the sucky times, the hard times, God's just there. God doesn't go anywhere. The, 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 my favorite statement about that, this is a fancy seminary term I learned. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name now that said it, but he said, that of which nothing greater than can be thought is God. That's, that's kind of deep. That of which nothing greater than can be thought is God. <clears throat> Aquinas said it a little easier, maybe. God has no potential. Well, boy, do we have potential. We have potential to change. We have potential to reach out. We have potential to be the hands and feet of Jesus for somebody, somewhere, every day. And sometimes that's just because maybe they feel good when you're around Maybe they experience the joy in you just by being in their presence. Maybe you're going to be in a relationship with somebody that was down and out and they didn't know they were down and out or maybe they knew it and just having you come into their life, just having you pop into their life, poof, out of nowhere. And they start to smile again. They start to live again. You see, I think that's the message of Christ. And I think that's what he means when he says well, he's given us life and life abundant. I don't think that means we're going to have lots of money. At least it doesn't for me. I don't think it means we're necessarily going to have a big glorious job. I don't think it means that we're going to be well thought of by everybody. And what difference does it make? We spend an inordinate amount of time to be thought well of by others. And we don't spend any time responding to the good news of Jesus Christ. So as we start a new year. That's where my focus is going to be. This whole year. I may read this scripture three or four, four more times this year. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick. Visit the imprisoned. Care for the people that are on the margin. The ones that are left out. The ones nobody sees. The guy that had his little camp built up here behind the stuff. That's who we need to care for. Because you know what? we got so many blessings in our lives. We, we, if we started a gratitude list, we could fill it up. If we, if we got a big white pad up here and started writing on, we'd be writing for the next two hours. That's right. We got a place to sleep. We got food. We got whatever we need. And I know the economy's been bad, and there's been all kind of turmoil about that. But you know what? It really hasn't affected me as much as I hear on the news. I still am able to go where I want to go and see who I want to see and do what I want to do. If I'm hungry, I can get food. Sometimes I have to get takeout. <laughs> but, but I can get food. <laughs> it's not like after Harvey when nothing was open. We became very often eaters of Chinese food because it was the only thing still open. I'm just saying it down. <laughs> we, we ate Chinese food for every other day. Because when we buy it, we get enough for two meals. So if it was every other day, we were back to the Chinese food. 
But it really, I think this is so important for us to think about these scriptures, these, these were when your mama told you something four times in a row, was it important? Yes. Yeah. I can hear my mama now. You know, Jack Allen, have you done your homework? Of course, my answer was, oh yeah, have you really done your homework? I mean, four times, if it's four times, you better start paying attention. Well, Jesus is telling us four times right here, four times he lists the things. It's in different circumstances, but he lists the same things. And what worries me is that so many of us, they call ourselves Christian, they work so hard to be the, the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. We look up and say, Jesus, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Well, because we didn't see him. We didn't look. We've got to correct our vision, don't we? You know, when I used to wear glasses, I had to go back every now and then get new, new lenses. If they do that now, I guess I'll get new eyeballs, but uh, I had to go get new lenses because my vision needed corrected. Well, here we are, the first of the year. I think these scriptures, to me, correct our vision. That's what I want to be. I don't do it perfectly, but even in my imperfection, I can do it every now and then. Because my desire is not to try to get into heaven, but is to introduce people into heaven now. If I do that, my trip to heaven is assured. The worst thing we can do is put Christianity on like it's some kind of a t-shirt. You know, it has cool stuff written on it. I don't have a fish on my car. Don't want a fish on my car. My driving doesn't always represent Christ. That's the truth. But I need one on my heart. If I can get it on my heart, I'm betting my driving will improve. My relationships will improve. Life in general will be better. I hope this means as much to you as it does to me. These are powerful words. They're the words that I think changed my entire life. And I think if you pay attention, maybe go home and read them a few times, they might change yours too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, tonight as we come to communion, it gives us something to think about. When you come to this table in the United Methodist Church, everyone is invited. Friends at home, uh, you're certainly invited to come. Uh, every Saturday night we have, have communion at this service on the first Sunday of the month like we'll have tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We'll be serving communion in the United Methodist Church. Everyone in the room is invited to come. And we invite you to come to Lord, the Lord's table. It's not this church's table or mine. It's the Lord's table where He reminds us that He brings the greatest gift of all. He gave Him His self up for us so that we could do the work that He left us to do. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you broken, sinners, imperfect, sometimes unwilling. And tonight, all of us here watching this anywhere ask you to forgive us. Give us strength. Most of all, give us your grace. As you make this bread and this cup become for us the body and blood of Christ, God, help us to become the body of Christ for friends and neighbors and people we don't know in this world. We ask for your strength because you've given us your mercy. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to invite the singers to come first, singers and players, and then we'll serve communion to everyone. So friends, as you come to this table, the breaking of the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? The sharing in the cup, is it not a sharing in the cup of the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Come to this place as you will, come and receive.
5:30. We're grateful for you being with us. We also are grateful for you being here with us tonight. You know, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. God's given us really simple instructions. Let's just go do it. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>